Hello and welcome to the very first edition of Telco Talk for the year. I'm Eleni Jarkos. For the past three years, the industry has been abuzz with talk of deployment of large-scale fibre-to-the-home projects both in South Africa and on the African continent. Yet, despite ongoing investment negotiations, this agenda has yet to bear substantial fruit. Is fibre-to-the-home the future or should we be looking to other forms of connectivity? Joining me now in studio to share their views, Angus Hay, Chief Technology Officer at Neotel, Rudolf Miller, founder and editor of My Broadband and Richard Kame, President of Fibre to the Home Council Africa. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us. I think first up, let's start to talk about the viability of this debate that is currently ongoing. And Fibre to the Home is a fantastic concept, but we know the cost of doing this is quite large. And this is one of the biggest challenges. Let's start off with you, Angus. Yeah, I think our stance on, on Fibre to the Home is well known. We've spent a, a lot rolling out fiber, fiber, what we call fiber to the curb or fiber to the business. Um, just walking down to your studio from the, the rest of Santon, you can walk across three or four of our manholes. We have fiber to the curb, which we then deploy mostly to business. And but can it be done to the home? We, we've always maintained that the challenge we have with fiber to the home, as any of the players in South Africa, is the, the, the investment in that real last mile, that last couple of hundred meters. And we need to find viable business models to make that happen. We do believe that there's a, a longer term uh, viability of fiber to the home for some parts of South Africa and, and in some areas. But the investment model needs to be looked at very carefully. Rudolph, your stance um, on this. I agree with Angus. There, there are certainly uh, problems with, with uh, a viable business model. But we must remember we can have um, innovative business models, specifically in South Africa, where you sit with uh, uh, security villages, for example especially if it's still a, a greenfield area where you can tell the developer, put fiber in before the house is even built. So that gets uh, built kind of into the cost of the house, which, is, which will be insignificant. And then it will be easy for a provider like Neotel to come in and connect the whole um, estate um, at a certain point and then provide services over that. So there are models like that. And we mustn't forget, we also have high rise buildings in places like Santon, high income areas. So those, those uh, buildings can also be connected. So although there are challenges because we're quite a spread out country, I think there are models that can be followed to make it viable but, uh, for from businesses. From what I hear, it's not for all. It's for select few, at least for now. Uh, certainly, yes. In some areas, there will be very large plots and difficult to connect yeah. these guys, yes. Okay, Richard, given mm. the fact that there is a fibre to the home, Council Africa, mm. uh, clearly this debate is obviously uh, being had because there are moves to embark on this at a, a large rate. Do you, right. What is your sense? Do you think that the, the debate that is ongoing and the challenges are starting to bear fruit going mm. forward? Yeah, look, I, I think the fibre to the home is going to happen. It's, it's really just a function of when, and I think that's a... A uh, function, I guess, of the of the funding issues is the affordability issue, and I think the other side is that of the users. I think users are changing and, and are consuming a lot more bandwidth than they used to for a lot of different applications. So it's it's not something you can really look at people who are really measuring their broadband spend on an internet connection. There are a whole lot of other uses and that, that would justify increased expenditure on telecommunications. Well, give us an indication of how much it would cost. I, I was asking you off air per kilometer, but you actually said per meter. So give us those numbers. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's going to vary very significantly. As Rudolph said, if you're starting with a greenfields property development, it's very, very cheap. If you're trying to retrofit a suburb with low density, large stand housing, it's, it's ex extremely expensive. Um, so it, it, there isn't, isn't a simple sort of answer. It is, it is obviously very, very expensive and that really is the, the current barrier. Do people value their telecommunications service sufficiently to, to up their investment Well, could in you give us a ballpark figure in terms of what consumers would be looking at? Well, <laughs> I probably couldn't. Uh, you know, I think the, the point is that the people's telecommunications spend is, is you know, if you add their, their DSTV subscriptions, their mobile bills, their, their broadband connections, if they have them, it's just increasing and probably, you know, in many cases, doubling every, every several years. And this is not years. going to help if we do embark on this because well, it's going to make it more expensive. Well, it will make it more expensive, but they can actually run quite a few of those services over a single connection. So in, in many respects, that is going to be how people do justify that, that fibre link into their house rather than multiple mm. different connections such as a wireless for 4G or 3G link and a ADSL link uh, and so on. So well, that's a good point because um, we know that telecommunication costs, communication costs generally in Africa as a whole is far higher than what we see in the rest of the world. Do you think that the, the local loop unbundling conversation that we've been having and we were hoping to see the local loop unbundled last year already in 2011, it hasn't been uh, done as yet. How would that change the conversation, no. Angus, for you? I think what's, what's very interesting about the whole local loop unbundling debate is that 
there are about 26 countries around the world that have unbundled the local loop. Interestingly, those are the same countries that have not had massive growth in, in fiber to the home deployments. And I guess the two sort of balance each other out. So ironically, one of the consequences of us having a delayed and, and ongoing debate about whether or not to un unbundle a local loop in South Africa is actually incentivizing further investment by players. Um, unfortunately, in a way that that investment is not targeted towards uh, individual consumers and homes. Um, it is targeted more towards the high end of the market. Um, and we have seen huge fiber deployments, I mean, across multiple different play, f players. There, there's a lot of access fiber being deployed, but it's been done on the basis of viable business, business models. So in, in a way, local loop unbundling is uh, not happening, is, has, has caused more fiber deployment, which is very good in the long term for South Africa. I just wanted to pick up on, on, on Rudolph's comment. The, the idea actually, if, if, you, if you Google the, the, the term homes with tails, you'll find a, a white paper describing exactly this model. And just to give you a sense of scale, I don't want to give you exact, you know, rand figures, but you could probably get return on investment on a single tail of fiber into a, uh, into a home. It may take, say, uh, three to five years to pay back the physical infrastructure on the basis of typical broadband prices. And that would work in any market. I mean, that would be something. And who would be else. bearing that cost? Obviously, the consumer. The, the secret with homes with tails is to move that investment. The secret of the homes with tails model is to say, look, any new infrastructure that's being built, any new housing that's being built, you're going to put water in, you're going to put electricity in, you're going to put other services in. If you put the cost of the deployment of telecoms into the cost of the house, which goes into the bond, it goes into the cost of the infrastructure that the, the homeowner builds, in many ways, then you can offset that cost and make it a lot more viable for competitor, uh, competitive telcos to then come in and, and deliver services. But what about existing infrastructure, existing homes? I well, mean, that's really where the debate comes in. There, a lot of the debate is around physical access. Um, and it's not just homes. It applies to buildings as well. So the, the challenge that we've had, and, and this is, I think, any of the, any of the challenger telcos in South Africa have had, is, that, is, is access to facilities. So it's not just you know, access to things like a local loop. It's things like ducts, rights of way, access into buildings. And in many cases, um, if you look at the way the, the, telecoms, uh, the telecoms legislation is written, so the, the EC Act is written, anyone who has a, a network license in South Africa has a right to deliver a service into the property of a customer. Mm -hmm. um, but in many ways, they're, they're, they're practical constraints. And so what we often do is, if working with businesses, for example, is uh, working with landlords to actually get physical access into the buildings. But often you find that you know, there is some infrastructure, there's some physical ducts, but they're occupied. Some other telco is already using them. And that kind of constraint is, is often hidden. We don't see that as being a constraint, but it's a, it's a structural constraint for, for challenges in the market. Rudolph, a little earlier you were talking about you know, South Africa and just uh, given the fact that the landscape is far different from what we see in Europe, where it's far more densely uh, populated, how different would the conversation be in South Africa if the local loop was unbundled, uh, given the fact that we still have the challenge that it's not as easy to embark on fiber to the home as it would be in the country or in countries such as Europe? Yes, uh, with local loop unbundling, uh, we must also remember in South Africa that would be mainly copper. So the d debate really is around whether telecoms should give other operators access to their copper. Now there is a bit of, a bit of life left in copper. Um, you, can, you can push the speeds, let's say up to about 20 megabits per second with ADSL 2 plus, if the local loop is short enough. Unfortunately in South Africa we've got quite long local loops, but there's a telecom is embarking on process and on projects to actually shorten the local loop. So there is a bit of life left in copper. But eventually, we're going to get to fiber. Um, there's a worldwide trend that governments are actually getting involved, trying to get their citizens connected to fiber. So although local loop may um, postpone the fiber for a while, if other operators can get in, into homes via copper, in, eventually, I would, would say so we will get to. I hope it's inevitable. And I hope South Africa will get there. This is my argument is, since it's going to happen, if we can agree that yes, fiber will happen, why not do it now? But Rudolph, aren't we, aren't we just focusing on the wireless element as well on the on, on, on the African continent? Isn't that the, the progress that we've made thus far? Yes, certainly. There, there is the argument that we can leapfrog um, technologies like copper with newer, faster wireless technologies, specifically LTE. Here you can push the speeds to above 100 megabits per second. So the argument is we don't need fiber. We can put up an LTE tower. We can provide very fast speeds to end users. Why do we need fiber? Fiber has a massive advantage 
in that you get your own piece of fiber and your own, if I can call it your own, massive amount of bandwidth. Um, there's a limited amount of spectrum in South Africa. You can never reach speeds and service levels over wireless than you can over fiber. So fiber really is the way to connect people. Okay, so what do you make of the argument wireless versus fiber, given the fact that you are part of the, the Fiber to the Home yeah. Africa Council? And mm -hmm. what kind of debates have been going on in Africa? Because again, we're trying to bring down the cost as much as possible, and that is really important in Africa. Yeah, look, at a technical level, there isn't really that much of a debate. I, you know, as far as wireless goes, there is a spectrum. Spectrum has a limited amount of capacity, and there's a market that's consuming more spectrum than, than, uh, than wireless can deliver. And to give you a, a point, an illustration of that, one of the mobile operators, I think we're forecasting that an average user would be multiplying their consumption of data by 80 times between 2011 and 2015. So you know, when you start getting an individual user consuming from, from 10 megabits per month to 800 megabits per month, yeah, it's just, there just isn't enough spectrum to, to cater okay. for that, uh, that uh, kind of you know, The cables on the east and, Af and west mm -hmm. uh, coast of Africa, how's that going to change? The wireless scenario and the fibre to the home scenario, we still have to bring that inland and, and what way can we bring it? Is fibre the only option? Or no, no it's not. And, well? and, and that's where, where wireless is going to play an ex extremely yeah. important role because it is, from a cost and speed perspective, it is, is the immediate viable route. It's, you know, there is a lot of investment going into it by, by mm -hmm. wireless operators and the, the costs are coming down, speed's improving. So in the short term, and I'd say short term, I'm talking, talking two, three, three years, it is really going to be the, the bridge that, that enables the whole growth of broadband to, to continue. Richard, just looking at the indication, who do you think should be paying for the rolling out of fibre to the home? Do you think that it should be telcos themselves? Do you think that government should be involved with regards to subsidies? Yeah, it's a, it's a, I guess that's a bit of a double-edged question because the, the, the you know, public sector funding is, has become a a factor in, in many economies around the world and governments are, are climbing in in a big way um, to, to help fund fibre rollouts. Um, that hasn't happened at all in, in South Africa and uh, even the regulatory environment government hasn't been very uh, facilitative of, of taking away a lot of the hurdles that make it very difficult to roll out fibre by, by, by private operators. So, uh, mm. so yeah, there's, there's still are some, some huge challenges there. Yeah, I mean, uh, our view is that you know, certainly you expect investment from private players. I mean, it's, it's not, we don't have any expectation from government to be rolling out fibre to the home. Um, but I do think that there are a lot of barriers that can be um, eliminated by the way government structures its policy and so on. Um, so I think the in encouraging the deployment of, of broadband, which is, is what's happening in many countries, and many, many of the policies around the world um, are, lo are less around direct government investment and more around either subsidies or um, in some cases more just creating the environment for the deployment of mm -hmm. broadband. So I think we, we could do a lot more in this country in, in terms of in, in, um, encouraging investment in, in access and that goes you know, equally for, for wireless and, and wireline. Uh, I just want to pick up on that, that wireless point to say you know, we've, we've also been of the view that they're very much complementary. Um, 4G LTE is really going to make a difference. Uh, you know, we've seen this with every generation of wireless technology. Everybody says, oh, it's the latest, it's the greatest, it's something different. What is significant with what we see with LTE is the kind of bandwidths we're talking about are starting to get to the level where an individual user is, is, is really getting to the amount of bandwidth which is almost impossible for an individual user to consume on their own on one device. And at that point, uh, what we're going to see is uh, really wireless becoming almost a seamless way to get onto the, the internet, yeah. to get onto the network. Can we pick up on that point? We're going to a short break and we'll be delving more wireless versus fiber when we come back. Don't go anywhere.